Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin, a reading from John chapter eight. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers in faith, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's been a quiet week in, my home, in, in Red Rock City, my hometown, out there on the edge of the Iron Range. The leaves, they're almost all down already. Not that anybody noticed with all the cold and the rain this last month. <laughs> and people, they haven't been outside much. Folks are itching to get out and rake and caulk and drain the pipes and put up their storm windows, but the rains don't ever seem to quit this year. Except for Sonny and, and Shelley Steele, the family who lives right next to Red Rock Lutheran, their place is all cleaned and cleaned up already. Everything is in its place. Even a pile of freshly spit, split firewood stacked and covered with a tarp next to the garage. They're always the first in the neighborhood to, to be done. I don't know how they do it. The rest of the neighbors, we all struggle to keep up. And I suppose in a way, that's how Sonny and Shelley keep the whole neighborhood looking good. Sonny's a great guy. He's always willing to lend me a tool or show me how to fix something. And he's doing much better now. He looked bad after his company went belly up. What was that? Nine years ago already? It's the only time I've ever seen Sonny when he wasn't perfectly dressed and under control. Of course, who could, be, who could be under control after what he went through? 22 years he put into that company, and it's gone. He lost everything but his home and his family. But I think the worst part for Sonny was not the loss of the business, it was the loss of respect. People treated him differently. He walked into the bank and the guys who were his buddies just a few years ago would no longer look him in the eye. Years later, Sonny told me how he survived those dark days. He, he did it by serving on the church council, if you can believe that. It was not a job he ever really wanted, but when he lost his business, it gave him a place to share his talents, to feel useful again. But going to church six years ago today, that's what really got him through. The way he talks about it, it was the day God spoke to him personally. It was Reformation Sunday, just like any other Reformation Sunday, but when they read the lesson from Romans, it was as if he heard the words for the first time. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Apart from work. It's all a gift, a gift. And Sonny repeated the words over and over. His, his work had been everything to him. It had been his whole identity. And after bankruptcy, he felt like his life was a complete failure. But now, he was a failure whom God loved. A failure whom God justified. Not on the basis of his work, but by grace a gift. He described it as the day old Sonny Steele, um, who achieved everything he set out to do, died. And the new Sonny Steele was born. He even looks back on that bankruptcy as a good thing in a way, because that's what it took to clear Sonny's eyes so God could give him this most precious gift. 
and he's doing fine now. He's got a job with Red Rock Technologies. He's, he's not making anywhere near what he used to, but it's enough. He's content in a way he never used to be. And now instead of worrying about the business all the time, he worries about, about Sammy and Sarah, his kids. He knows they're going through some tough times, but well, he's the dad, and who shares stuff with a dad when you're a, when you're a teenager, right? Sammy's in his senior year, and I've noticed something different about him, too. This was supposed to be his year, senior year, the year he played guard on the varsity basketball team, and he's been working for this year ever since I've known him in third grade. But now that it's here, he just seems angry. I suppose it could be the new kid at school, the freshman from Moose Lake. I mean, the kid, he's good. Several Division I schools sent scouts to every game he played last year as an eighth grader. The kid can shoot, he can dribble, he can pass, and I can see where Sammy might be frustrated. He's been practicing all of his life for this year, and now it looks like it'll be taken away by the Moose Lake kid. And Sammy also seems to have lost his place with his basketball pals. They hang around with the Moose Lake kid now. And it's just not what he expected his senior year to be. It's not what he was promised. He'd always heard from his coaches, Sammy, if you work hard, you can succeed. You'll play varsity someday. And Sammy has worked hard. He's worked harder than anyone on the team. He's done everything they've asked, plus some. So where's the payoff? His sister, Sarah, is a delightful young woman. She's in ninth grade already. I don't know if you realize that. And she's the kind of daughter anybody would like to have. She's on the volleyball team and the student council at school. She's active in her youth group at the church. She even likes confirmation. <laughs> and she isn't afraid to stand up and tell you what she believes. She started a vegetarian movement at the school to save the animals and to free up more grains for people to eat. Sonny and, and, and Shelley are so proud of her. But she's been losing weight lately. Most people think it's the volleyball and not eating meat. But the deeper reason she's a vegetarian comes when she looks in the mirror. She looks at herself and she sees nothing but fat thighs, fat hips, fat waist. She puts on her makeup and she can't help but notice that the face looking back at her looks nothing like the faces she sees on TV. Vegetarianism makes it harder to hide. She can eat less without all those questions. And every morning she vows to make her body look like those bodies on TV and, and now she can even see, she can see that she's thinner than the models are. But she still doesn't eat. Not eating is kind of a way to punish herself for not being pretty enough. She's trying to take away the shame and the ugliness she feels inside. And Sonny would love to be able to tell his kids what he found out in his bankruptcy. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are now justified by his grace as a gift through Christ Jesus. It wouldn't help Sammy make the basketball team, nor would it make Sarah into a model. But it would give their weary souls peace. Sammy could find his self-worth in a God who loved him rather than on a basketball court. And Sarah could find out that God loves her looks. God loves her passion for justice and her communication skills. But how can Sonny tell them if, they don't even, if he doesn't even know what's going on? Well, maybe they can talk to Shelley. Shelley's Sonny's wife, and she's always been much more approachable. But she's going through her own crisis of faith right now. And you wouldn't know it by looking at her. She's a faithful church member, she sings in the choir, she volunteers at the thrift store. Her house is so clean on the inside she makes Bob's yard, or, or, or Sonny's yard look like a dump. From the outside she seems to have everything together. But inside, not so much. I should have seen it. 
I mean, lately she's become something of a health nut. She's always taking good care of herself, but suddenly she's a woman obsessed. She subscribed to several health magazines. She has a supply of all the latest pills. She goes to the doctor's office all the time for odd, nondescript symptoms. And she seems to be in perfect health for a woman in her 50s, but she still isn't comfortable. My wife said it started when her mother died. Shelley was a saint in those days. She could not do enough for her mother, even cared for her at home during hospice. And deep down, it frustrated her that her mother didn't improve, even though in her head knew, in her head she knew her mother was dying. And the two women spent time talking a lot about God and praying and talking about heaven in those months. Shelley's mother was quite a woman of faith. And she wasn't afraid of death. And she loved having this time with her daughter. Shelley admired her mother's faith and, faith and tried to be strong, but she wasn't sure she could believe in a God who would allow this to happen to her. And she found herself suddenly being not so sure about the resurrection or about Jesus or about anything, any of the things she had been taught since she was a little girl. Her mother's death was so peaceful. Her family gathered around, they shared stories and tearful goodbyes and, and even some laughter. And mom's last words were, we're all beggars, aren't we? But God is merciful. And she fell asleep and died. And those last words were driving Shelley to despair. Where did mom get such faith? I don't have it. I don't know if I can believe. God's not gonna be merciful to a doubter like me. Well, last week during fall cleaning, Shelley found her mom's confirmation Bible. And there was a bookmark in it. She opened to Romans 3. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through Jesus Christ. Words Shelley had read a thousand times and she almost shut the Bible, but then she noticed something written in the margin, her mother's writing. It said, meaning, third article. Shelley closed the Bible and packed it in a box, but the words kept bugging her, meaning, third article, what's that about? Finally, she dug out Sarah's catechism and read Luther's meaning of the third article. I believe that I cannot, by my own understanding or effort, believe in Jesus or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and strengthened me and kept me in true faith. Quickly, Shelley grabbed Sarah's Bible and turned to Romans 3. All have sinned and fall, fallen short of God's glory. We are justified by his grace as a gift through Christ Jesus. And it was as if her mother had sent her a message from the grave. Even believers are beggars. Even her mother had doubts. Faith itself is a gift from God. And it was as if her Lord had wrapped his arms around her, doubts and all, and promised to take care of her. Shelley held Sarah's Bible close and thanked God for her mother. Well, that's the news from Red Rock City, where the Roman Catholics are strong, the Methodists are good-looking, and the Baptists